Hello, it is WendyM here, and today I'm going to tell you how to not die. Many have commented that Pathfinder 2e is a challenging system for players, even brutal at times. Whether or not the system is too demanding is a debate I'm not going to get into. What I am going to do, though, is talk about all the different options you have as a player to keep your character alive. There are many defensive mechanics in Pathfinder 2e. Some of them the game expects you to utilize, so much so that they're functionally requirements. In this video, I'll do an overview of every major defensive mechanic in the game. These will be split into two big sections. Build options, which are choices you make when creating your character, and encounter options, which are choices you make during an encounter with an enemy. In each section, I'll discuss what the mechanic is and how much you need it. This will partly be my opinion, but a lot of these mechanics are actually baked into encounter balance. With that said though, let's get into it. Your most obvious line of defense for any character is their hit points. They're how much damage you can take before you die. Pretty straightforward. Most of a character's hit points will come from their class, which varies from 6 to 12 hit points per level. A bit comes from your ancestry as well, which varies from 6 to 10 hit points, but it only gets applied once at level 1. This means your choice of ancestry is quite important for defense if playing a level 1 character, but becomes less and less important the higher level you get. I wouldn't recommend choosing an Ancestry based on their hit points, unless they'll only be played up to level 3 or so. There's also the Toughness general feat, giving a character extra HP equal to their level. This is a very strong choice for any character defensively, but not required. The part of your hit points that you have the most control over, though, is your Constitution. Every point in your Constitution modifier increases your maximum hit points by your level. So a level 10 character with plus 4 con gains 40 hit points. That is a huge chunk. It's especially big if you're playing a class with low HP per level, such as a wizard. As I showed in my video discussing dex versus con as defenses, constitution is extremely effective for low HP characters. In my opinion, if you're building a level 1 character, you should always start with at least a plus 1 to constitution, or plus 2 if you can fit it in. Then when you get ability boosts every 5 levels, you should probably boost constitution every time, at least until it gets to plus 4. There's no hard and fast rule on how many hit points you should have, but this rule of thumb will ensure your character doesn't lag behind. Armor class is another extremely important defense. It's also an especially interesting one. The basic formula for armor class is 10 plus your armor's AC bonus, plus your dex bonus up to the armor's dex cap, plus your armor's potency rune, plus your proficiency. Every character should always have the best armor potency rune available to them, so plus 1 at level 5, plus 2 at 11, and plus 3 at 18. Your proficiency will basically be dictated by your class, with the exception of the armor proficiency feat, giving trained and a heavier armor type. So what you have control over when building your character is basically your dexterity modifier and your specific armor type. The interesting thing about AC is the way that it's capped. Assuming your character has the best available potency rune, there is a hard cap on how high your armor's AC bonus can be after including your dexterity. This limit is plus 5 for unarmored, light, and medium armor, or plus 6 for heavy armor. What I claim is that every martial character should be at this AC cap or possibly one point below it in order to survive a fight. Casters may need to start further below the cap, possibly by as much as 4 points, but should be able to approach it over time via dexterity boosts. For example, consider a sorcerer who has no proficiency with any armor. They will wear explorer's clothing for an AC bonus of 0 and dex cap of plus 5. This character should probably have no lower than plus 1 dexterity at level 1, and then try to boost it every 5 levels until it reaches plus 4 at level 15. They'll never quite reach the AC cap, but instead start 4 points below it and go up by 1 every 5 levels. Let's instead consider a druid who has proficiency with light and medium armor. If they have at least plus 1 strength, they can wear studded leather, giving a plus 2 AC bonus and plus 3 dex cap. If they then start with plus 1 dexterity, they'll be 2 points below the AC cap and go up by 1 every 5 levels, reaching the cap at level 10. And as a last example, a fighter has access to all armor types. If they have at least plus 3 strength and plus 1 dex, they can probably afford splint mail before even reaching level 2, putting them at the plus 6 AC cap right away. If they instead are dexterity based and use light armor, they can start with plus 4 dex and also be at the plus 5 AC cap. I go through all of these examples to show that while armor class has a hard cap on it, and every character should move toward that cap, your choice of class has a huge impact on how soon you'll be able to reach that cap. 
the general takeaway is to always have the best potency runes and simply to think about that AC cap and try to be as close to it as you can. Saving throws are another important form of defense acting as an alternative to AC. Virtually all damage your character takes will be from an effect that either rolls an attack against your AC or forces you to make a saving throw against a set DC. So between your AC and all three saves, these collectively are another line of defense against all damage, much like your hit points. Anecdotally, around 60 to 75% of the damage a character takes will be from attack rolls, the other 25 to 40% being from effects with saves. This means that your AC is much more important than any individual saving throw as a defense. While your saves are still important, you don't have a ton of control over them. Save proficiencies are strictly dictated by your class. The portion you control is the modifier from your ability scores. Dexterity, constitution, and wisdom each contribute to one save. No character can make all three of these scores very high, but take them into consideration as the more defensive ability scores when building your character. Just try not to put all your boosts into strength, intelligence, and charisma. Though I'm not sure exactly what kind of character would want that combination anyway. A very dashing magus, maybe? Anyway, the other important thing to remember about saving throws is resilient runes. This is another defensive item the game absolutely expects you to have. If you get each rune at its level, you'll get plus one, plus two, or plus three to all saves, at levels 8, 14, and 20, respectively. These make a very big difference, and every character should have them. Resistances are a much more niche defensive mechanic than the others so far. There are many different sources in the system of getting a resistance to a specific damage type, usually equal to half your level. Many heritages grant this, or some ancestry feats, or a few class feats. The amount might sound small, but I promise it adds up when you get attacked multiple times. These are pretty much always to a non-physical damage type, meaning they won't come up every fight, and are thus not widely applicable or needed for every character. These are still nice defensive bonuses to pick up when they're available to your ancestry or class. Shields are a very interesting defensive mechanic because they're a decision in how you build your character, but also require active use to benefit from it in an encounter. Whenever you spend an action to raise your shield, you gain plus 2 AC for the round, which is a huge defensive buff. It's also worth noting that unlike other systems, shields don't require proficiency and can thus be used by any character. The cost is not having a free hand. A melee character can't use a two-handed weapon or dual wield, and a wizard, witch, bard, or cleric can't wield a staff and a shield while keeping a free hand for material components. This is a very big cost, let alone the regular action cost of raising your shield. Casters can instead use a buckler or the shield cantrip, which gives a smaller AC bonus and essentially breaks after one block. Speaking of shield blocking, a few classes get shield blocked for free at level 1, and all others can take it as a general feat. Shield blocking is a very interesting defensive mechanic, because it reduces damage taken from an attack and deals the remainder to both you and the shield. As a result, shield blocking is hard to use against big attacks, as the shield will easily break in one or two blocks. It's much more reliable when used against many smaller attacks. A character who expects to shield block regularly should also ensure that someone in the party has enough crafting skill to repair it, but this isn't terribly hard. The bottom line here is that shields are an extremely effective form of defense, with an extremely high cost in the form of a hand and actions. If a character wants to be as tanky as possible, a shield is a must. For anyone else, it's a decent option. Feats are a much more general mechanic than what I've discussed so far. And I'll be upfront, each individual feat will not make a huge difference in your character's overall survivability. But if you haven't noticed yet, characters get a lot of feats in this game. They add up. I've already mentioned a few general feats. Armor proficiency, toughness, and shield block may be useful for a variety of characters to improve certain defensive stats. There's also die hard, but other than that, general feats don't do much for defenses. Skill feats also aren't highly defensive in nature. Ancestry feats do have some very useful features, such as the resistances I mentioned earlier, or circumstance bonuses, or rerolling checks. Even more important are class feats, since you get them twice as often as ancestry feats. Let's look at the druid for an example. I count at least seven feats with the sole purpose of defense. Not all are available to every druid, but if you take several of these, you'll have occasional boost to AC, resistance to one or two damage types, bonuses to saves on diseases and many spells, or more. These choices do add up quite a bit. 
and stacking situational defenses only increases the odds one will be relevant. Again, taking a bunch of defensive feats isn't a must for every character, but these do add up and should not be dismissed. Items are a difficult thing to talk about because there are just so many of them in this system. I'll start with the must-haves, though. Every character should have the best armor potency and resilient runes available to them at all levels. I can't stress enough that the system assumes that you have these in its encounter balance, and if you don't, you will be significantly easier to kill. Other than that, though, there are no single items you must have for defense. There are many useful ones, though. Elixirs of life, anti-plague, and antidotes are always good consumables to have in case you need them. Potions of bark skin or potions of resistance give resistances to certain damage types. Again, great to have at the right time. Energy resistant or fortification runes and armor go a long way to having more defense, giving resistance to damage types or a chance to negate any crit against you. Bracers of missile deflection are a decent circumstantial AC bonus against ranged attacks. Healer's gloves are a decent way for any character to give themselves a touch of healing mid-combat. And finally, Rings of Energy Resistance are one more way to acquire a permanent resistance. Note that these, as well as energy-resistant armor runes and potions, give double the amount of resistance normally granted by an ancestry or feat. None of the items listed here are individually mandatory, but all of them are solid defensive options that aren't too hard to acquire. Every character should try to take advantage of some of these items. The last section in build options is spells. Again, these are hard to talk about because there are so many. I'll be honest, I'm not going to discuss every single spell that's used defensively, but suffice it to say there are a ton of ways casters can help themselves or their entire party stay alive. Here are just a few especially good highlights of spells casters should consider. Heal is a classic spell present in nearly every party used to keep your character standing for longer. Bark skin and stone skin are two great sources of resistance to physical damage during a fight. Blur makes a character concealed. This is a fantastic defensive buff, giving a flat 20% mischance to it all attacks on them. Resist Energy is another useful source of resistances. This one especially good because it can be used flexibly depending on what damage type you're up against. Blink is a weird one. You gain resistance to all damage except force, with the downside of teleporting around at random each turn. This is a bit hard to control, but could also be an upside by getting you out of melee. Usually, I think this isn't too big of a penalty for the big defensive boost. Now for some higher level spells. Scintillating Safeguard is a fantastic reaction to a big area of effect hitting the entire party. You give everyone resistance 10 to it. Energy Aegis takes a whole minute to cast, but gives the target resistance 5 to all energy damage, plus negative, positive, and force damage, or resistance 10 when cast at 9th level. The thing I like about the spell, though, is that it has a duration of 24 hours. So you could cast in the evening and get the spell slot back while keeping the resistance during the next day. Prismatic Armor similarly grants resistance 5 to all energy and force damage, but lasts only a minute. The upside is that when an enemy attacks the protected character, they make a will save or become dazzled for a whole round, or blinded on a crit fail. Lastly, the Composition Cantrip Inspire Defense may be only available to bards, but this spell is incredibly good. All allies within 60 feet gain plus 1 to AC at all saves, plus resistance to physical damage, and Inspire Heroics can further increase the bonus. I can't stress enough how strong this is. As I discussed in my previous video, plus 1 to AC results in roughly 11% less damage taken for the entire party, in addition to the resistance. This is fantastic. All of these spells are solid options for a caster keeping their party alive. Keep in mind that this doesn't even go into spells that debuff enemies. Those spells can be even more effective as defense, but are more risky as they require saves. The spells listed here are strictly ones that buff characters. I'll talk more about debuffs in the next section. So we've talked about the many options available to you to make your character survivable. You should pay close attention to your hit points, armor class, and saving throws, and consider using a shield to be as defensive as possible. After that, picking feats and spells are extra ways to prepare for certain situations, and investing in certain items can be very effective for further boosting survivability. But now we have to talk about how you use these things in an actual encounter. It's easy to think, especially coming from certain other RPG systems, that building a tanky character is good enough. It's not. In Pathfinder 2e, playing your character strategically is also vital to surviving a difficult encounter. 
To start, let's talk about debuffing enemies. I've mentioned buffing allies' defenses several times, especially with spells, but debuffing enemies' offense is equally important. In fact, one of the most common strategic mistakes in Pathfinder 2e is underutilizing debuffs because they feel too small. Trust me, they make a big difference. Once again, there are dozens and dozens of ways to reduce your enemy's ability to hurt you. I can't go over all of them, but I'll highlight some big ones here and mention the main sources of debuffs. Most kinds of debuffs come in the form of conditions. The conditions that most directly reduce offensive abilities are blinded, dazzled, enfeebled, frightened, prone, sickened, slowed, stunned, and stupefied. Confused, controlled, fleeing, paralyzed, petrified, and restrained are even stronger, but are pretty rare and difficult to apply, so I won't discuss them as much as primary defensive mechanics. Now I realize this is a lot. These are nine different conditions that can all affect an enemy's ability to damage you. But remember that any creature will only take a single penalty of the same type to any roll. If you apply Frightened 2 and Enfeebled 1 to an enemy, they'll only take a minus 2 to their attacks, as both apply status penalties. So don't think that you should be applying 5 different conditions to an enemy to reduce their checks into the ground. There are some that stack though. Enfeebled, Frightened, Sickened, and Stupefied all apply status penalties. So these 4 can't stack for reducing attacks. Dazzled and Blinded each impose a flat check to target creatures. So they don't stack with each other, but they do stack with any other penalties. Prone actually imposes a circumstance penalty to attacks, so it does stack with any of these, though it can be ended by taking an action to stand. And slowed and stunned each take away actions, but don't stack. A creature who's slowed one and stunned one only loses one action. With all of these together, there are sort of four categories of common conditions that will all stack in reducing an enemy's offense. But how do we actually apply these conditions? Like I said, there are tons of ways. Let's start with two basic skill actions. Trip is a straightforward way to knock an enemy prone with an athletics check, but the action is an attack and so contributes to attack penalties. Demoralize is a basic intimidation check versus a will DC to inflict frightened one or two on a crit. Lots of class feats provide further actions used to inflict conditions, which I won't go into here. Many items also have the ability to cause conditions. Injury poisons like lethargy poison or giant scorpion venom cause slowed or enfeebled. The Fearsome Rune on weapons causes Frightened on a critical hit. Plenty of specific worn items, weapons, or armor grant more actions to inflict conditions. But the big source, the most variety-filled way to apply conditions to enemies, is your spells. There are probably over a hundred spells that inflict these conditions. In lieu of spending ten minutes on the segment, on screen are a couple suggestions of spells that are especially efficient at applying certain conditions. Every caster should have some spells in this vein, and just about every encounter should try to take advantage of them. I won't go into great detail on buffing party members because I've basically already talked about this in the form of defenses, spells, and items. This section is instead for talking about when to use such buffs. Defensive buffs are not only for pre-combat. Plenty of buffing spells and actions are worth doing mid-encounter when you realize they're useful. And of course, actions like raising a shield or casting composition cantrips have to be done every turn to continue being used. Defensive buffs are absolutely worth using in a fight and can make up for the opportunity cost of offensive actions. The tricky part is knowing when to do which. Do you try to get the enemy down faster or protect yourself from their damage? That's a question that I can't quite answer for you. As a GM though, I do get to see where players could do better. The most common mistake is going to all out on offense. In a raw battle of attacks, creatures will often win. A more subtle mistake, though, is having offensive characters spend entire turns on defense. When your fighter or barbarian spends a round positioning or taking cover, they just lost a huge amount of potential damage from even just one strike. So yes, you need to spend time defending in combat, but the characters with the highest damage output should rarely, if ever, go a whole turn without trying to deal damage. One other mistake people make is taking defensive actions very late in an encounter. I often see a battlefield full of creatures one or two hits from death, and the PCs see all their enemies still standing and start to heal or prepare for a long haul when they'd be better served trying to finish off the enemies. I don't blame them, of course, they don't know the enemy's hit points. But keep in mind that defensive actions may be less useful late in a fight. Although it's much less quantifiable than the other mechanics I've discussed, knowing about your enemy is a great line of defense. Recall knowledge checks are a useful way to learn what damage types they'll use, what conditions they'll inflict, or if they have an area of effect ability. Even just knowing a creature's lowest save 
allows you to more effectively debuff it. In an ideal scenario, you can acquire this knowledge in advance of an encounter and prepare for it, but even in the middle of a fight, knowledge can go a long way to protecting your party. Healing in Pathfinder 2e is much more effective during an encounter than in certain other systems. The heal spell, the biggest source of healing, scales very well and is quite action efficient. Plenty of other heal spells and healing items work well too, plus combat medicine if a party member has it. I probably don't need to say it, but much like defensive buffing, healing during a combat is worth the actions. This is one mechanic that pretty much all players intuitively understand is worth using. Just about every party should have at least a bit of healing capability during a fight, whether it's from spells or consumables. In a similar vein, every party should have healing outside of combat, so that the party can enter each encounter without too much health missing. Unlike many RPG systems, the encounter design of Pathfinder 2e generally assumes the players have most of their HP going into each encounter. This is another mechanic that's much harder to quantify, but it's also one that many parties overlook. Too many encounters turn into a blind rush into engagement. Sometimes that's the best option, but not always. The most general piece of advice for defensive positioning on the battlefield is to keep squishier characters further away from enemies. This is simply to encourage enemies to focus their strikes on melee characters rather than spend their actions moving to the backline. If your melee characters have attacks of opportunity, this further locks enemies in melee. Another benefit of this tactic is that a party can focus its defensive buffs and healing on the characters getting hit the most. The extreme version of this tactic is to fight in a choke point. This has upsides and downsides. On the one hand, you gain near complete control over which party members the enemies can attack, so you can fully focus your defenses on those characters. On the other hand, the enemy gets the same benefits. You can't move forward to engage enemy ranged characters. In addition, the party becomes extremely vulnerable to areas of effect. Another good positioning tactic can be to have melee characters actively move away from enemies. This will depend on enemy reach, speed, and access to attacks of opportunity. If they have attack of opportunity, but not reach, spending one action to step away can force an enemy to spend an action moving back into melee range, trading actions one for one. If they don't have attack of opportunity, and your speed is higher than theirs, you could take a whole stride so that they have to take two full actions just to reach you again. In the right situation, you can trade one action for two enemy actions. Note that the usefulness of this tactic will also depend on the level of your enemy. Each action is more valuable to a big boss enemy than to a lowly minion, so trading one for one is much better on a tougher enemy. But positioning as a whole is a valuable tool that can be used to your advantage more often than you might think. And lastly, yes, Offense does improve your defense. I'm not going to say a good offense is the best defense, but I can say that having a good offense is necessary for defense. Like I mentioned in the buff section, your primary damage dealer should almost never go a whole turn without attacking. Obviously, if your party never deals any damage, you're going to lose the fight at some point, no matter how defensive you are. The trick is finding the sweet spot. Even if I knew everything about a specific encounter, it would still be very difficult to optimize offensive versus defensive actions. There are just too many variables for there to be a simple answer. When many of those variables are unknowns, such as an enemy's stats, this is even more difficult. Tactical mistakes are inevitable when there are unknowns. At the end of the day, it's something you have to get a feel for. Or just guess. And there you have it. In this video, I've gone over every major defensive mechanic in Pathfinder 2e, every category of ways in which you can keep your character alive. Some of these you can get away with ignoring. Parties that don't pay much attention to placement or call knowledge will still do great if they're sufficiently buffing, debuffing, and healing, in addition to having a good individual defenses in the first place. And no, you can't really pay close attention to every single line of defense in every encounter. Think of these more as tools in your tool chest. Now you know a little more about which tool to pull out and when, and you know you can't just do it with your hands. No shade meant to unarmed monks though, they actually can do it with just their hands. But that's all for this video. If you think of anything I missed or should have talked about more, please drop a comment and I will respond to it. If you liked the video, feel free to like and subscribe to let me know to keep making more like it and to feed the algorithm. You can even give me money on Patreon if you really want. If you didn't like it, please let me know in the comments what I can do better or what you'd like to see instead. But this is 1DM out. Have a great day.